So I realize the hour is late, but I will again thank you for including me in this wonderful program. It is unclear to me if it is a privilege or a punishment to close at the end of a long and fruitful day like this. So I'll try to be relatively brief, but what I want to do is leave you with food for thought, not answers. As an outsider, a number of things struck me today, and one is a reminder that even though I've been teaching for 15 years, I am consistently pleased to see how frequently the first thing my students do when they hear a rule is they ask why, and if we focus on the why, we always do a little bit better. The other thing is, if anybody tells you that they know the answer or the answer is easy, ignore them, okay, because it's just not realistic. So a few observations from today. I was pleased to hear that in the discussion of the EU directives, the cabinet official acknowledged that the directives are a compromise. The critical point is in a compromise, not everybody gets what they want. Now, I'm not saying when that this compromise is optimal or that it's a model, but then again, I feel the same way about the US procurement system or the UNCTRAL model law. No one has figured out the actual optimal solution yet, so we keep learning. Now, having said that, much of what we just saw in the discussion, and much of our discussion generally, comes down to definitions and nomenclature. So, for example, just take the words discrimination and preference. Discrimination sounds like a bad idea. Preferences are things that we want to support. That's a good thing. But they're the exact same thing. They're just opposite sides of the coin. On the one hand, our first principle is that we shouldn't discriminate, but everyone agrees that local money should support the local economy. So obviously we're in agreement to disagree or be inconsistent. And one of the problems is how do we define our economy? Is it the local neighborhood? Is it the state? Or do we live in a global economy today where as we learned less than five years ago, all economic events now have global ramifications? So in any event, Keep in mind in all these discussions that nothing is cost-free, particularly when we talk about transaction costs. When we talk about procurement rules and directives, we're talking about process. Any change to the process, whether you legislate or regulate, has tremendous transaction costs for the government, for the private sector, and over time. Change is not free, and we don't talk enough about transaction costs. Dermot uses the example of the 50-page solicitation for the small value procurement. At what point does it make sense to walk into the big box retailer and use a charge card rather than do process for process's sake? And these are hard questions to answer. So let me close with a thought experiment. And I often do this with my students because my students are excellent at memorizing rules, all right? So let's take a step back. Let's assume that your eldest, my eldest had his 18th birthday this week, but let's assume that your eldest, 18, 21, 25, is about to go out and purchase his or her first car with his or her own money. And they know that you're a procurement professional, so they sit down at the dinner table and they ask for your advice and you say, the most important thing you need to think about when you go out to buy your car is don't discriminate, okay? You make sure that you give Fiat and Peugeot and Hyundai a good hard look, even if they don't really sell cars in our neighborhood or our state, and even if they don't have a well-established service network. Oh, and while you shouldn't discriminate, please be sure that you buy from the domestic automaker and make sure that you have your car serviced at the neighborhood service station. And so at this point, your son or your daughter pushes back and says, but what if the domestic manufacturer costs more? What if everyone agrees it's less reliable? When I was in college, what they told me was the best thing that happened to the U.S. auto industry was that we let the Japanese compete, the Americans upgraded their act, and now they compete globally. So why should I buy domestic? At which point you respond, what are they teaching you in school these days? And then you change the topic. Then your child <laughs> pushes back, and your child says, no, no, but really, how do I decide? And you say, well, the second most important thing for you to do is make sure there's no fraud in your transactions. Don't take a bribe and make sure you, you follow all the rules. And they say, no, wait a second. Your kid says, but that's not what Consumer Reports or Edmonds or Parker is telling me. And you say, wait, 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 I wasn't done. Just remember, you have to be transparent. I need to be able to have a paper trail of everything you've done, and the neighbors are going to audit everything you've done, and I want to make sure that you give all the automakers the opportunity to sue you if they don't sell you <laughs> the car. Now, Mom, Dad, look, I didn't learn any of this in economics, in my economics class. You know, shouldn't I be thinking about economics? And you say, of course, 
you should go out and buy the least expensive car that money could buy. And you say, but wait a second, when you bought the car for my older sister, you told her the most important thing was that it had the highest possible safety rating because you were concerned about her safety. Do you not care about my safety? <laughs> and you say, no, no, but that's an evaluation factor. It's not a fundamental principle. And so your son or daughter pushes back and says, well, okay, so I've got safety, I've got gas mileage, operating costs, reliability, maintenance costs, potential resale value, the number of doors, how much storage space is in the boot or the trunk or whatever. And you say, yes, yes, you should consider all those things, but they're not important enough for us to basically have rules on because those don't apply to everybody. Okay. So then your son or daughter says, but maybe I should be thinking about the fact that I shouldn't buy a car at all. What if I lease a car or basically use a car sharing arrangement? Should I factor in the costs of parking, for example, in my purchase? At which point you say, now you're talking about requirements. That has nothing to do with procurement. And the conversation goes on. All of which leaves me with the basic aspiration that I have is that what we really need to do is do exactly what we're doing here and that is having a continuing conversation where we share our best practices and learn from experience. Ask yourself based on what we've just heard today, is procurement the engine that drives economic development? Is procurement something necessary that supports the government's function? Is procurement something that is basically consumer behavior in a government context? Well, it's all of those things. But the reality is, if you look at what's happened in the global harmonization of procurement in the last decade, the public procurement discussion is being driven by the trade community. It's been driven by the WTO's GPA, and in your world, it's being driven by the EU. It's not being driven by procurement experts. It's being driven by trade officials, which fundamentally doesn't make any sense. But in any event, it informs our discussion. The nature of public procurement, everything we've heard today, is that it's a study in contrasts. In the United States, we have a regulation that says that the government should always exploit economies of scale. And for that reason, it should buy in quantity to get better prices, and we call that consolidation. But we also have a regulation that says that we should always disaggregate purchases so that small businesses can compete, and if we don't, that's called bundling and that's prohibited. That's what we just spent an hour talking about. At the end of the day, in law school, one of the fun things about teaching is we have a difference of opinion on our faculty. Is public procurement no more than contracting in the context of the administrative state, or is it an administrative function that takes place in the business community? Is it a regime where consumer behavior should come first rather than being an afterthought? My belief, and we heard this time and time again today, is at the end of the day, procurement is all about people, not rules. Successful procurements begin with good market research, and they conclude with a liberal use of common sense. And the sad thing is, is you can't legislate either one of those. So maybe what we can agree is the first responsibility of a true procurement professional is to think, and maybe that's a productive starting point. It's been a real pleasure talking with all of you, and I hope we see some of you tomorrow. <laughs>